By 1996, Bret the Hitman Hart was a three-time WWF World Champion and an international superstar. Once a scientifically gifted tag team wrestler in a sea of heavyweight brutes, Hart's work ethic and persistence, as well as the non-ideal circumstances that changed the landscape of the company, eventually led him to assuming a heavy burden as the promotion's lead dog. But while Hart poured his soul into the now ailing WWF, former champions began making their way to Atlanta, lured by unfathomable contract offers from an aggressively ambitious WCW. Closing in on his 40th birthday, the hitman wanted to continue doing right by his longtime home and the boss who made him his champion. But when Eric Bischoff came to him with the Godfather offer, Hart found himself at an agonizing crossroads. The parting shots of WrestleMania 10 two years earlier were of Bret Hart being coronated. The hitman had outlasted Yokozuna to capture his second WWF Championship inside the hallowed halls of Madison Square Garden. The night was considered a shining success from a critical standpoint on the strength of two all-time excellent matches and a feel-good ending. But all wasn't so steady within the WWF. On a night where the company used its first double-digit WrestleMania to look back fondly at memories of Mania's past, it was also openly trumpeting its new generation, assuring us that Hart was going to be the leader of the new pack for a decade or so to come. Wrestling promotions on their game will always emphasize on the future, but usually they do so without explicitly telling you this is the future, good times are ahead. That extra emphasis tends to feel a little desperate because there's a sense of urgency to make something stick and stick quickly. You see, WrestleMania 10 was the first mania to not feature Hulk Hogan in any shape or form. In each of the first nine events, Hogan was a crucial part of the final scene, and to a casual fan, there now seemed to be a large Hulkamania-shaped hole in the portrait. The fact that WrestleMania 10 was the least purchased mania since 1987 speaks a little bit to that sentiment. Times were changing, and the common comforts were conspicuous by their absence. The Hulkster had last wrestled for the WWF on a European spate of shows in the summer of 1993, and his relationship with the company was now strained. McMahon may have no longer been interested in pushing Hogan as the invincible superhero that he'd been in years prior, but a WCW needing star power certainly was. WCW Vice President Eric Bischoff courted Hulk in the early months of 1994. Hogan didn't come cheap, however, and in order to acquire his star power, Bischoff had to agree to a multi-million dollar deal unlike anything WCW had ever offered before, with conditions regarding cuts of merchandise, live events, and pay-per-view revenues, plus creative control with very little tether. WWF had the right to match any offer WCW made within a 21-day window due to the terms of Hogan's release in 1993, but there were no such offers coming. In May of 1994, a representative of Titan Sports informed WCW that they would not counter the offer to Hogan. There weren't much means to counter anyway. The WWF was in financial distress come 1994. McMahon simply didn't have the disposable resources to match the unrivaled terms of WCW's deal for Hogan. Attendance had plummeted to concerning lows, pay-per-view buy rates sank, and McMahon was facing a costly trial that summer, where he'd stand accused of distributing steroids to his performers. Although McMahon was found not guilty, he and the WWF were tarnished by the bad press, and sponsors like toymaker Hasbro pulled out of deals with the company. They'd also lose their connection with Slim Jim after pitchman macho man Randy Savage followed Hogan to WCW later that year. For close to two years, Savage was used sparingly in WWF, relegated to the announcer's desk and not coming off the bench enough to his own liking. After a long period spent stewing over this consistent relegation, Savage struck a deal with WCW in late 1994, and his Slim Jim sponsorship also made the trip south. 
Six months apart, WCW signed away two men who had been WWF World Champion for more than seven of the previous 11 years. As long in the tooth as both mega powers may have been by this point, the casual fan knows Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage when they see them. For a WCW that craved that sort of connectability with the at-large audience, both signings were absolute no-brainers. Even before Savage made the leap, McMahon's roster lacked the pizzazz and star quality that it once had. Vince was now forced to rely on his New Generation campaign, where he attempted to make the new Hogans out of what was available to him. One theoretical Hogan clone bolted in 1995, when an unsigned Lex Luger snuck out of the WWF. The Lex Express had long been abandoned by the roadside when Luger covertly took a lowball offer from a skeptical Bischoff to return to his former employer. The exit may have been quiet, but the re-entry created tremors. His appearance on the debut episode of Monday Nitro stunned millions, including his former boss, who didn't even realize that he'd left. And in early 1996, more bad news made its way to McMahon in the form of a jarring 1-2 combo. It began with Scott Hall sending a fax to McMahon in February, indicating that he didn't wish for his expiring contract to roll over. Wanting more money, Hall was unable to get McMahon to give him a raise, nor would McMahon allow the man behind the Razor Ramon character to work outside dates in Japan for some extra cash. After reaching out to Bischoff through friend Diamond Dallas Page, Hall received an offer of a three-year guaranteed contract worth $750,000 per year, capped at 150 dates per year, which was far lighter than the WWF's grueling schedule. Hall, a four-time Intercontinental Champion and one of the company's most recognizable stars of the day, officially gave his notice. He would finish up with the WWF that May. Shortly after signing, Hall revealed he was leaving to his best friend Kevin Diesel Nash, whose year-long reign as WWF Champion had only ended months prior. Nash was shocked at both his friend's impending exodus and the mouth-watering terms of the deal he was receiving. Then it happened. Bischoff reached out and was now offering Nash a similar contract. Nash's WWF deal was set to end the first week of June 1996, though originally he wanted to stay and continue working for the man who put him in a position to command such a towering offer. He hoped that McMahon could match the guaranteed money, if not the dates. With a kid on the way and the possibility that, at 36, his future days as a wrestler could be limited, Nash wanted the best economically driven contract possible. But McMahon couldn't and wouldn't match it. Though losing big names in the midst of a competitive wrestling war wasn't ideal, a financially cloudy WWF committing to contracts of that expanse could prove costly in more than one sense. And so it came to pass. Hall and Nash were WCW bound. Through the attention-getting NWO storyline, these outsiders were treated like major stars from the moment each arrived. The fact that the main event of July's Bash at the Beach pay-per-view was a monumental six-man tag that featured the five aforementioned wrestlers in addition to company icon Sting really embossed WCW's mantra that this organization is not only where the big boys play, but also where the big boys got paid handsomely to do so. And that leads us back to Bret Hart. The Hitman went on a long hiatus after WrestleMania 12 in 1996 upon dropping the championship to Shawn Michaels in overtime of a 60-minute Iron Man match. While recharging his batteries at home, the 38-year-old was enjoying life with his family while exploring outside opportunities. Michaels was atop the WWF Summit, but it was his best friends from the clique that became the talk of the industry. The New World Order's hostile takeover kicked off a long run of unabated ratings victories for Nitro over Vince's Monday Night Raw, carrying over into the spring of 1998. WCW was not only thriving on Monday nights when most predicted instant failure, but they were now commanding over WWF, Raw, and by obvious extension, Vince. With Hart at home taking an extended breather, all McMahon had for established heroes were Michaels, The Undertaker, and a stale, unpredictable Ultimate Warrior that flamed out in a matter of months. Though now a free agent, Hart fully intended to return to the WWF ring, but he was also looking to diversify his life. Having performed on the television series Lonesome Dove over the previous couple of years, Hart wanted to further pursue acting, especially with his 39th birthday approaching and his days as a full-time wrestler likely winding down. With four children at home and the knowledge that the next wrestling contract he signed could be his last, Hart understood all too well the importance of money. 
In his 2007 memoir, Hitman, Hart wrote that when Nash revealed to him the specifics of WCW's offer to him earlier that year, that it was more than what Hart was making as WWF champion. The courting process between Hart and the WWF began earnestly. He sat down in June 1996 with McMahon and Jim Ross at Vince's Greenwich Mansion, where the three had a pleasant chat about plans for Brett's return, which included resumption of his championship feud with Michaels. A meeting between Hart and McMahon a month later was apparently far less lax. As Hart remembers, the day after the In Your House International Incident pay-per-view in Vancouver, McMahon chartered a flight to Hart's Calgary home, attempting to sign him to a contract then and there. McMahon reportedly told Hart to name his price, but Hart calmly declined signing while assuring him that he'd still return down the line. The sudden haste to get Hart signed came largely in response to WCW's frenzied NWO angle. When Hogan revealed himself as the renegade faction's third man, WCW only became more the talk of the wrestling industry, whereas the WWF had nothing on its menu with that kind of spice. And business continued to slump. Ultimately, the fiscal year from May 1996 to April 1997 showed a loss of $6.5 million, while total pay-per-view buys would drop over 20% in that same time frame. SummerSlam 1996, featuring Shawn Michaels' world title defense against the monstrous Vader, proved to be the least bought SummerSlam in history at just 157,000 buys. Had it not been for 1995's King of the Ring and Survivor Series, this SummerSlam, during a time of war, would have been the least bought Big Five pay-per-view WWE had ever run to that point. Michaels, for all his in-ring brilliance, was not the lone antidote to WCW's rollicking momentum. While Vince sought to reinforce his product by whatever means, the intrigue around the New World Order only mounted. Recent ex-WWF talents such as Ted DiBiase and Sean Six Waltman joined the cause, furthering the perception that the group, and WCW by extension, were greener pastures for any WWF performer wanting to play for a winning team. The Hogan-led faction painted Nitro in its black and white colors, while the show's rating in September and October began pasting Raw by wider and wider margins, at times beyond a full point. The night after WWF's Mind Games pay-per-view saw no bounce for Raw, as McMahon's show lost to Nitro 3.4 to 2 flat. Days following the pay-per-view with Hart still absent on TV, the Hitman met with Eric Bischoff. Hart came to Los Angeles to record a guest spot for The Simpsons when an eager Bischoff met up with him at his hotel. The two spoke for a while before Bischoff got to the heart of the matter, asking what it would take for him to jump to WCW. While Brett was happy with WWF, he did throw out some pretty bold terms. About $3 million a year and a lighter schedule, perhaps similar to what Hall and Nash were promised in order to leave McMahon. Days later, Hart received a call from Bischoff, who had spoken with the bosses at Turner. He had the authorization to offer Hart a $2.8 million a year deal for three years, plus a cap of 180 dates per year. The hitman stood to make four times per annum what he'd made on his last WWF deal. When Hart reported this offer to McMahon, Vince conceded that he simply couldn't match it. Understanding his longtime boss's predicament, Hart asked him to simply make the best offer possible. As Hart wrote, he was in a position to make $9 million in just three years. I don't want to leave, but I don't want to be stupid. Less than a week after Brett confided Bischoff's offer to him, McMahon flew to Calgary to personally deliver his counter offer. In addition to allowing for Paul Jay, a filmmaker that wanted to do a documentary on Brett to have unprecedented backstage access, he laid out the terms of his contractual offer. A 20-year deal worth $10.5 million. The way the contract was staggered, Brett would earn $1.5 million a year for three years as a wrestler, $500,000 a year for seven years to be a senior advisor to McMahon, and $250,000 a year for 10 years beginning at age 49 to essentially be a standby or a legend emeritus who might be used, might not be used, but would still earn a living from the WWF in his middle age. While WCW did offer almost as much money for 17 less years of employment, Hart valued his standing with the WWF, not to mention the history and the moments that he'd created there, and he felt indebted to Vince for giving him the opportunities and platform to become the star that he was. With the deal agreed upon, there would be minor details to tend to, and Hart would return to WWF television the night after the October 20th Buried Alive pay-per-view to accept Stone Cold Steve Austin's challenge for Survivor Series. As with many things in life, though, it just couldn't be that easy. 
As Hart deflected Bischoff's attempts to try and sweeten his offer, he waited for WWF to actually send him a draft of the contract so that he could sign it. When the contract arrived three days before his scheduled return to TV, Hart claimed that it looked nothing like the deal he and McMahon agreed upon, calling this document very controlling. Brett's lawyer, Gord Kirk, even advised his client that only an idiot would sign it. Hart then attempted to call Vince, only to get a hold of McMahon's wife Linda instead. Brett informed her that he would not show up to Raw for his advertised appearance until the matter was straightened out. As Hart was still technically a free agent, he had every right to stay home. While he hadn't agreed to WCW's offer, Brett hadn't turned it down either. With the contract still gonna be wanted it, Hart pressed for McMahon to make good on the offer that was made to him in his home just nine days earlier. Vince got in touch with Brett and claimed, according to Brett, that the company's legal department had sent the wrong contract, which Hart termed a lame excuse. Hart flew into Fort Wayne, Indiana for the episode of Raw, with the understanding that he would be signing the proper contract on the day that he was to appear. He claims to have had this WCW contract folded up in his back jeans pocket as he made the trip, with the move to the competition still a very real possibility if there were any more hang-ups. With the aid of his attorney Kirk, his accountant John Gibson, and then president of WWF Canada Carl DeMarco, a longtime Bret Hart supporter, Hart received a reworked deal, one that managed to wrest away even more control for himself. One of the considerations was that Hart, should he ever leave the WWF, would receive reasonable creative control for his final 30 days under contract. Hart, McMahon, and the necessary parties met backstage at Raw one hour before showtime, where, at long last, the signatures were put to paper. That night, Hart made his return to WWF programming after seven months away. He put the WWF over while cameras panned to commentator McMahon, looking a combination of proud and relieved. Thanks in part to Hart's appearance, Raw, though still losing to Nitro on the night, did its best TV rating in close to two months. Hart was happy, McMahon was happy, but one individual was less than pleased with this turn of events. Shawn Michaels. The then WWF champion re-upped his deal for $750,000 a year in 1996, and claims that he asked McMahon to not pay anyone, with the exception of The Undertaker, more than him. When Michaels found out that Hart was now earning twice his annual salary as a result of the negotiations, he claims to have angrily confronted McMahon, feeling insulted by the situation. But with McMahon now forced to work harder than ever to hold on to prized assets, what else could he have done? As for McMahon, while he was still happy at the time, he too grew sour before long. A case of buyer's remorse besieged the boss come 1997. Having Hart in the fold didn't make any earth-shattering difference in the weekly television battles with WCW, and although Hart remained a valuable on-screen figure with a considerable fan base, anti-American heel turn notwithstanding, for what Hart was getting paid, McMahon felt that he wasn't living up to the sizable price tag. Before long, McMahon, while claiming financial hardship, attempted to amend and then cancel the deal with Hart, while encouraging his by now reigning world champion to reopen negotiations with WCW. But that is a war story for another time. <laughs>